Okay, that's all guys. So in this video, we are going to talk about how entrepreneurs can optimize their day-to-day -day output and efficiency, become an A player and ultimately scale on autopilot. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jasper Mank and I run Herculean Biology where we help founders build a jacked body with optimal clarity, energy and focus. If you want to join the community, you can find the link in the description. And lastly, be sure to watch this video at 2x speed to save yourself some time. So who this can help? Well, this is for the entrepreneur who always strives for more and cares about showing up at their highest level day in and day out. If you've read the self-help books, do the personal growth and still self-sabotage, then this video can also be a great start. I've personally been and have had clients in both situations. So here's the better path for optimizing your output. In McKinsey's high performance study, which I referenced a bunch of times now, you see an 800% difference in efficacy between average and high performers in highly complex tasks such as those found in entrepreneurship. I think it's pretty safe to say that high performers don't work eight times as many hours. The average difference in working hours is likely not that different and could even be lower in many instances. Therefore, we should optimize for quality and tangible output of work above all else. How do we go about that though? Um, first thing I want you to understand that there is a big problem behind most of the advice surrounding productivity and performance. Firstly, people that already suck at having high output become interested in improving it. Secondly, they make gradual improvements through the recycled advice of a dozen self-help books and start sharing their advice. Then thirdly, this advice then gets shared with the public and everybody else that sucks at having high output loves the mental masturbation of the different practices and long routines that they're doing and the feel good that they get from that, but they're not being productive. Meanwhile, the guy who just does the work has 10 times higher output and only does about 3% of the stuff that people preach. Now, I'm not judging these people because even though my clients got pretty good results in my first year of business, I was still doing this to quite a large degree. So with that being said, this is the actual plan for maximizing efficiency. First step is to identify the 3% of habits and practices that number one are optimized for you. Secondly, do not create dependency and thirdly, increase work production rather than being a crutch. Secondly, we want to build flexible systems around these habits so that they can then be implemented without much effort while maximizing the ROI on the time spent. And lastly, we want to then identify the 3% of activities that matter so we can spend the vast majority of our time executing on those or building out systems that scale the activity out for us. To identify the 3% of habits and practices that are best for you, there are a few meta principles I will share with you. And the end goal of this entire video is to get you closer to that 800% increase in output to headbutt your opposition. So here's the game plan for optimal output. There's a lot that goes into optimizing day-to-day -day output and efficiency, but the 80-20 comes down to five different levels. Firstly, there's clarity, so we want to begin with the end in mind. Secondly is fear, so we want to identify, understand, and then lastly, eliminate fear. Thirdly, we want to shift our identity. Fourthly, we want to optimize our health and our cognition. And then the fifth level is we want to pull the slingshot and really push the extremes. I've identified these principles as five major milestones I often see in the journey of the entrepreneurs that I work with, and they are linear. You can't work on the next level before fixing the one before that or not do it nearly as well. If you don't know the end goal, there is nothing to strive towards and thus you'll stay in your comfort zone requiring little change. That's why we need to begin with the end in mind. Once we know what the end goal is, we can actually start to step outside of our comfort zone and start to make progress towards this end state. The problem is that if we aren't aware of what we're afraid of, our subconscious is going to continuously sabotage us back into old programming. Fear is the biggest driver of self-sabotage, so once that is fixed, we then have to look at our identity, which shapes our beliefs, actions and habits and make sure that is all in alignment. Then, once our overall mindset and awareness are in point, we have to make sure that our bodies are optimized. We are very much psychosomatic creatures, and our physical health is a huge driver of optimal decision making and performance. Then, lastly, with a clear vision, no debilitating fears, a supportive identity, and optimal health, all that is left to do is push our boundaries, persevere through challenges, and relentlessly pursue our goals until completion. If you're already familiar with any principle, just move on to the next level. But I do recommend you to watch the guide in its entirety, find the level that you find most challenging, and then immediately start to take action on that rather than it becoming another piece of knowledge. It's important to know that each level is enabled by focus. You don't tap into performance or peak performance overnight. It's not like you just flip a switch, although over time you can get better at that. It's much like compound interest. So it's 1% better today, 1% better tomorrow. Similar to the concept of sharpening the ax, if you don't already act in line with massive congruency with your goals and with your plans, it can make sense to prioritize perfecting your habits above everything else. Then by the time you actually execute on the level that you need to be executing, it would just be unreasonable for you not to achieve your goals. 
So let's dive in. Level one is begin with the end in mind. And I love this quote by Ray Dalio where he says, you can have pretty much anything you want, but you can't have everything that you want. Creating clarity around what you want to achieve, why you want to achieve this, who you need to be to achieve this, and when you want to achieve this, doesn't just motivate us, but it creates tangible increases in performance. When we have clarity, our efforts are focused, which allow us to clearly allocate our resources. Then we also make better decisions because clear objectives provide a framework against which decisions can be measured and made with higher accuracy. Increase persistence because entrepreneurship is not easy and having a clear understanding of the why and what's on the other side keeps us going. And enhance collaboration where if you're working in a team or you have a team, you will create more unity by creating a clear outcome. So below are the three layers of tools to actually cultivate more clarity. And know that specifically on this first level, these tools take some time to set up. If you've done a lot of work similar to this, then this might be a waste of time and it could be smart to just skip to the next level. But if you haven't really gotten clear on this, then the ROI can be quite drastic. So the first one is called self-offering. Writing about your past, present and future self, which is called self-offering, has a number of benefits, including enhanced self-awareness, emotional regulation, resilience, motivation, and an increased likelihood of achieving professional goals. So step-by-step -step process, you wanna take a morning and the weekend off and make sure you are well rested. Wake up early, sit down in a quiet space, open a document and just start writing. You can either start with past self-offering or future self-offering, but I put past self-offering here for the example. So to start by writing your past, which you can break down into epochs or segments that make sense to you. And for every period of your life, you want to note down significant events, relationships, important people, successes and challenges. And you want to reflect on how they shaped you as a person and focusing not only on the event itself, but also on the way you felt and acted. Then you want to take a quick break and you want to go to future self-offering. So you want to write about your ideal future in about three to five years. What does life look like in that state? Where are you? What are you doing? What have you achieved? Write it down as a narrative, like a story and preferably in the uh, the third person. So uh, X person does this. Jasper is in this situation in three to five years. Then you want to take another quick break and then you want to do present self offering. So what you're doing right now, what's going well, what's not going well. And then lastly, you want to reflect and make a conclusion. Also make a plan on, okay, these are the goals that I have. This is how I messed up in the past. This is how I'm behaving currently. This is what's going well. It's not what's not going well. And creating a planning and maybe even a daily reminder to yourself of what you should do and what you shouldn't be doing. So secondly, we want to define your audacious goal. Now that we understand the long-term vision, we can actually start to set targets. And when setting goals, we want to make sure that they have a few components. First of all, they have to be massive. Your goals have to be two times, 10 times, 100 times. You have to stretch your mind. If you're looking to increase your income by 10%, just so you can buy one more sandwich per month, you're not going to have any extra push to get out of bed in the morning. It's not going to do anything for you and it'll probably just harm you. Second is that the goal has to be transformative. Your goals have to challenge you to get close to the highest version of yourself. You have to make a transformation to actually achieve the thing. You have to grow. And lastly, it has to be purpose-driven, which doesn't have to be some huge humanitarian goal. You just have to understand the long-term and the short-term upside of what you are doing. Lastly, write down as many whys as possible of why you're working towards this so that when shit hits the fan, which it is going to, you are going to be able to stay the course. Last tool that I will give you is to establish the hell. So now we are clear on what we want to have and the specific targets that we're pursuing. So we lastly need to get clear on what we don't want to have happen. If you keep going the way you are going, how are things going to end up? That's the first one. And the second, if things are going to get worse and you let the opportunity that you have in front of you slip past you, what does that look like? Uh, negative visualization is one of the most powerful tools that we have access to because we are more programmed to run away from pain than to actually acquire and chase pleasure. Level two is identifying, understanding, and eliminating fear. So fear is an invisible force that shapes a large part of how we behave and the choices that we make. And when we talk about fear, it's important to separate two types. First up is real fear. It's a direct fear where the fight or flight response gets triggered. You get frightened or you're in a life-threatening situation. Your heart beats faster, your muscles get tense, adrenaline surges through your body and you're literally ready to fight or flight. So the second fear is anxiety and this is a more subtle form of fear. It's important to understand that this form of fear is not pointed at a direct situation, but it instead concentrates on the future. People can have anxiety about their financial future, how people have perceived their actions, what's going to happen if they fail, and so on. Now, typical for people who live in anxiety is the fact that they almost constantly live in their comfort zone or a state that feels safe and certain, but in which little to no personal growth or success is possible. To live a life that stands for success, satisfaction, and personal growth, which I assume you want if you're watching this video, it's a requirement to frequently step outside of your comfort zone. And the more often you do, the fewer things will be unfamiliar to you, thus creating an upward spiral of confidence. 
The thing is, is that we are often not only afraid of the unknown and what's ahead of us, but we're also scared to leave the old things behind us because, you know, right now we know what we have and we know what we can expect. When you leave everything behind, the paradox of change will kick in, which is where a part of you will want to explore and grow, but another part will want assurance and safety, which is the part that's holding you back. And it can be hard to leave this thing behind, but whoever has the courage to actually extend their boundaries is the person who gets the greater rewards in life. Grant Cardone also says it in his book, in the 10x rule book. If you're not taking actions that create fear, you're not pushing hard enough. Everyone is held back by fear at times, but when this fear shows up on a daily basis and hinders us, we're speaking about an anxiety disorder, the worst form of this being a phobia. This is when something that poses no inherent threat triggers a fight or flight response. In other words, the fear of this person is disproportionate. And a great acronym to remember for this is fear or false evidence appearing real. Fear is nothing other than a state of mind, and your state of mind is subject to your control and guidance. You can't create something that you can't think of firstly in the shape of an impulse. Realizing this, it's key to take on a fearless mindset. So, a fearless mindset is a state of mind in which you take action despite the presence of fear. You feel the fear and you do it anyway. People with a fearless mindset know how to become the boss over their own fears, and they know how to succeed despite them. The alternative is to let fear paralyze you, guide your choices, and run your life so that you will never realize your full potential. The choice is yours, but the first change that is necessary to get unstuck and to live your best life for that matter is to make a real decision to become fearless. So the most common fears are fear of success and fear of failure, which are kind of flip sides of the same coin. Fear of critique, fear of disease, fear of loss of love, fear of death, fear of age, fear of poverty, and a big one, which is a fear of not being good enough. So here's the single best four-step process for actually dealing with fear. Firstly, it's identifying your fears. If you don't know what you're afraid of, it's going to be very difficult to overcome it. And I can tell you that everybody is afraid of something. If you think you aren't, you are deluding yourself and you just need to go a level deeper. Secondly, once we identify what we're afraid of, we want to understand our fears. Where did these fears originate? Are these evolutionary? Are they programming from past experience? Do they maybe come from childhood? What are they trying to tell you and what is a potential benefit that these fears have? Because, right, if they wouldn't have a benefit, they probably wouldn't exist. There is a reason for them. Next, you want to eliminate the fears. So you want to break them apart. Are they beneficial to you nowadays? In what ways are they damaging you? Is it time to step over the discomfort and rid yourself of them? And so on. And then lastly, once you actually have gone through this process, you will have way less fear in the first place, but you want to take action in spite of whatever fear remains. It's not just going to magically disappear because you understand why it's happening. You have to trigger and train your body and your brain to do the thing again and again until it becomes you and it is no longer a problem. So level three. Shifting your identity. I already explained the concept of our core identity in my video from last week, which is the five elite performance strategies. Uh, So be sure to check that out if you haven't already. If you have heard me talk about this before, quick recap to elevate your identity, there are five primary methods. First up is association. So surround yourself with people who are ahead of you in whichever domain you are looking to improve. Second thing is putting in the work. When you put in the work, it'll make you feel like you deserve more, whilst also just grading your luck service, improving the chance you actually get more. Third thing is integrity, so you want to build a relationship with yourself in which you can trust yourself to do what you said you would do. And self-confidence is the thing that arises from integrity. Fourth thing is responsibility. So you want to assume responsibility for everything in your life, everything that is good and everything that is not so good. Last one is living what you know. So don't just keep it to knowledge. Most people know what they should do. They've read the books and they're just not taking action on it. You want to live the thing. You want to apply the thing. If you're reading a book and you're not taking action on it, just keep rereading it if it's a good book until you take the actions uh, that stem from that book. So below are some of my favorite tools to aid with shifting your identity. And the first thing is the villain. So in any great story, there's dualism. There's a good guy and a bad guy, a hero and a villain. And without the villain, the hero's journey lacks depth and it lacks context. Visualize yourself as the hero of your own story. And just like any hero, struggle is a normal part of your journey. It's a crucial part of your growth, allowing you to strengthen your character. Now, just like any good story, it's crucial for you to create your own arch nemesis or your villain, who is the person who represents the higher version of yourself. This guy is the person that embodies the character, the skills and the energy that you strive for, as well as the behaviors that you want to adopt. So sit down for a second and imagine your villain vividly. What does he look like? How does he carry himself? How does he walk? How does he talk? What energy does he give off? How do others perceive him? How does he handle stressful situations? What does his daily routine look like? What is he committed to? Does he have an hourly rate for his time that he sticks to and outside of that he outsources it to other people? 
When does he say no? What standards does he uphold? Maybe he's the guy who never misses a workout, who always wakes up at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., who always follows through with his commitments, the one that approaches a guy or a girl that he thinks looks interesting, no matter how nervous he might feel. The guy who is always on time, the guy who is always authentic. It doesn't really matter, just get clear on this. Create a clear contrast between you and your villain, the person who you are striving to be. And get more points of these. So after about 10 of these, it's going to get difficult and you want to think deeper and create a list of at least 20 different points. Now that you have this list, keep your villain at the back of your mind. You want to actually start living with this person in the shower, for example. Like if this person is, if you're taking a shower and you're standing there in the, the nice hot water, think, okay, what would the best version of myself do? Does this person have time to stand in the shower for 20 minutes or does he get back at it and is he dressed by the time I get up? When you are in the gym, does this person do another rep or uh, is this person quitting at the same level where you're quitting? Then once you've actually created this person, you got them visualized and you started to actually get this person imprinted, the only thing that you can do is either compete or lose. And it's important to realize that this person that you created is you. It's just a you who took a different path and who built a few different habits. So here's some other tools. The first thing is consistent habits. A handful of consistently executed habits can create a huge foundation to perform off of. This is also the main upside with a morning routine. It's just that most morning routines are way too long. I generally wouldn't recommend doing anything longer than 15 to 20 minutes tops uh, if doing any type of morning routine whatsoever. But taking a morning walk, for example, every day at the exact same time, that builds momentum. And it's not about the activity itself although walks in the morning are very beneficial it's about you being the person who does the thing consistently who wakes up every single day at this time and then starts his day with a walk and a pro tip is that physical momentum actually builds mental momentum when you're walking more, you are more active in your brain. Second thing is long-term thinking. So long-term thinking fixes everything. If you constantly have your identity and your long-term goals top of mind and you act in alignment with them, it is very difficult not to hit your goals unless you really love to fuck up your life, which is not uncommon. Last thing is meditation. So huge benefits in every area of your life, but the two best things are the separation between thought and self and the ability to control the mind, which both are obviously key. Okay, so level four, optimizing health and cognition. This is where high and elite performers are separated. You can have the previous levels in check and still be a Mac loving dumbass. You can only change your mental state so much if your biology is not in check. And so this is why with level four, we're building a healthy, energetic, strong, and resilient body. Like I said before, we are highly psychosomatic creatures, what we do in the physical realm transfers to the mental realm. It's not about the reason that we tell people to get a grip if their life is out of whack. Grip strength is directly linked to psychological resilience. The same goes with grow a backbone, right? We want people to have a strong back and a strong back helps with that. Physical training is as much mental as much as it is spiritual as it is physical. Without going to the gym, it is highly doubtful if I would have even ever gotten into personal growth or entrepreneurship or any type of fruitful endeavor. Optimizing your general health, energy, and cognition, it's all a very big topic and it's also quite individualized. So you can either shoot me a message one-on-one -on -one and we can have a look, or you can go to the following resources to get going. So the first thing is a jumpstart nutrition guide that I made. Second one is a three huge levers for energy video that I made. And the last one is a full health guide. Uh, I'll have these links in the description. And if you want to access the document, then join my Facebook community. It's okay, so a level five. This is where we're pulling the slingshot and we're pushing the extremes. Sometimes you have to take a step back to take 10 steps forward. That's what the previous modules were about. Level five is where we dive in head first and we start to take 100 steps forward. In my eyes, levels one to three just enable you to compete and take you from bad to good. Level four separates you from pretty much anybody else and that would take you from good to great. But to actually go from great to unstoppable is level five. To perform at this level sustainably, you have to first solve the other levels. Otherwise, you won't be able to sustain the intensity and the clarity of mind that it requires. To really make quantum leaps in progress, it's all about establishing one primary target, eliminating everything else or putting it on maintenance, and then attacking that thing relentlessly. The main thing that comes into play here is the slingshot effect, which states that the more force we apply, the bigger returns we get. There are two phases to the slingshot effect. So the first one is the loading phase. This is where we pull back the slingshot and we make it more and more difficult for us to continue to do so, but also creating greater and greater returns in the process. Then in the release phase, we let go, we relax, and we let things run their course as we recover for our next loading phase. Most people let go of the slingshot daily by watching TV or Netflix for hours upon end before bed. Then others grind money through Friday, through which its efficacy is debatable, but then they drink heavily on Saturday and impair their cognitive function for most of the next week. 
The longer you can sit in discomfort and stay in that loading phase, the greater your returns will be. So stack good habits and understand that performance is much like compound interest. It's about one more minute of meditation today, one more minute of reading today, one less minute of time wasted, one more outreach done, and then one more tomorrow. And I highly recommend reading the book Relentless by Tim Grover, which really gives a great overview of how some of the world's greatest achievers push the extremes and tap into their own dark side. I can tell you when you're really pushing yourself to the brink, there is no other feeling like that. And I chase that feeling constantly. Here's some other tools that enable you to optimize for the slingshot effect. So first thing is a season of no. Everything that doesn't align with the main goal becomes a no, albeit a temporary one, which allows for a greater yes later if you so choose to. You want to get an assistant. So if you don't already have an assistant, just get going and start to outsource tasks because as you start doing it, you start training your uh, delegation muscle. Meal planning. So preferably you want to have your meals planned by a nutritionist and prepared by a chef or eaten raw, depending on how you want to do things. And last thing, you need to have mentors. So find people who have been where you are and are where you're looking to go and perhaps even help others get to that point.